Hey everybody, this is your host, Vinyl Man Jeb. This is the Jeb and Green Podcast. Tyler's with me today. Hello. And we're interviewing Paul Chastain of Velvet Crush and his side project, Small Square, his solo stuff, and works with Matthew Sweet. Paul, how are you? Doing good today. How are you guys doing? Good. Calling all the way from Japan, so good morning. Good morning as <laughs> yes, we're going into the evening. In, uh, we're in Hyogo Prefecture here in Japan, oh, over that's awesome. close to Osaka and Kobe, that area. That's beautiful. Nice. All right, cool. And I'll move- Hey, Tyler, if you want to ask the first question, I'll let you get right into it. Yeah, so um, so what are who are your inspirations as a musician? <clears throat> um, wow, you know I've been playing a long time, so uh, initial inspirations are I don't even think about that kind of stuff anymore. So it's hard to remember, but um, you know I'm inspired kind of on a daily basis by by different stuff that I discover or see. But um, um, you know originally I think uh, I was like you know I started playing kind of like in high school or junior high. And um, at that time, I was playing a trumpet, right? So it's hard to be like a rock and roller on a trumpet, right? So, um, but anyway, I liked horn bands at that point, like Chicago, and I, I actually still like uh, Chicago. And I really thought that um, Pete Sotera, who was the bass player, I thought he was pretty kick-ass for that sort of jazz rock kind oh, yeah. of oh, bass awesome. playing. And then, then after you know, for after I started being in rock bands, I was like, yeah, that's kind of dumb stuff. But then I recently, I've actually listened to some live. Chicago stuff from that time when they had the guy Terry Kath on guitar, and, um, yeah, Terry's a talent. You know, kind of a monster. And then, so, but Pizza Terra was actually a kick-ass bass player. <laughs> he really was, right? Uh, and a great vocalist too. In retrospect, yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, one they were actually a really good band, three vocals. But then yeah. I got to say, you know, probably early on, probably you know, Paul McCartney was a huge influence, and then like uh, you know, John Paul Jones and the sort of classic rock uh, bass guys like that were my kind of bass inspirations. And I think uh, those bands on a whole also, that sort of level of musicianship that, you know, the Beatles, of course, but like I, I was uh, obsessed with Zeppelin for a while um, later on, you know, later, like sort of post Velvet Crush even, or, you know, in, in later Velvet Crush kind of times, just uh, not, not discovering them, but like just listening to the records and how great they kind of played and how great they recorded them and all that stuff, all the other stuff that you don't think about when you hear it on the radio. Um, so I get inspired stuff by stuff like that, like the sounds of things now more than maybe more than the playing, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So speaking of uh, Velvet Crush, when, when did Velvet Crush start? When did you guys start out? <laughs> um, I think we started, we say like late 89. What happened was um, we were all from the Midwest, the U S Midwest there. And um, uh, Jeffrey, our, who became our guitar player, uh, he's from Wisconsin, and he had moved to, to Providence um, a few years before we did. And we we just were sort of heading to the East Coast for kind of different reasons. That Rick and I decided to just move and have a band somewhere else besides the Midwest. So we decided to go to, like, Boston area. Oh, yeah. And then we ended up in Providence. Um, just it happened that way. And then he said, yeah, you know, I know this guy Jeffrey. And um we contacted him and Jeffrey like is, I don't know if you've ever met Jeffrey, but he's like the nicest guy in the world. So he said, you should come and you can stay at my house for a while and we'll figure out, you know, how to get, you know, where you can be and stuff. And he hooked us up with his landlord and did all the stuff. And, and eventually, um, you know, we started playing with him, not right away, but eventually we did that once we sort of got our legs going, but that was around late 89 or early 90 when we started doing that with him. And it was just a three piece um, to begin with. It was kind of always a three piece, and then we added we added people here and there to do stuff with us. And always, always when we played uh, tours and things, we had a fourth, you know, guy. But yeah, so like was ninety, that, was there a fourth 90. guy uh, Tommy Keen? By any, there was Tommy Keen you guys worked with as well, or Tommy Keen did a lot of, a lot of touring with us. Uh, once we did um, Teenage Symphonies, which was our second record, and it was a major label record. Um, um, it ended up being major label record. We, we well the history of it. Before that, let me go back a little bit. All right, perfect. <laughs> uh, we uh, we released a record on our own called In the Presence of Greatness, which we recorded on you know weekends, kind of going over to Matthew Sweet's house when he lived in Princeton, New Jersey, and we lived in Providence, so it wasn't so far to go. And we would go over there, and we were friends with Matthew, and he recorded our record and played guitar on um, that. What became our first record. So that record then. Um, we sort of convinced uh, Creation Records in England to uh, license that record in the in the UK, and so they Creation Records, who you know we were fans of that label, um, Alan McGee and his crew, 
And so they put that record out, and then uh, that became, you know, we got, from there on, we got signed to, by them to do the next record, um, which was Teenage Symphony. So they had a deal with, um, with Sony Epic over here in the States, and so we were on Epic uh, in the States to do Teenage Symphony. So then we had, you know, we had a little cash to work with for touring and stuff. So that's when we got, to answer your question, that's... For that touring, which was substantial, we did probably, uh, gosh, I don't know, maybe 18 months of touring for, for Teenage Symphonies. And a lot of that was done with uh, Mr. Keene as our fourth member. We started out doing some with Mitch Easter, who produced the record. He did the first part of our touring with us. And then after, he couldn't do it all because he was running a studio and had other bands and stuff that he does. So um, at that point, we... Um, we knew Tommy, you know, kind of, and were fans of, so we called him and asked him if he would join, and he did. And so he came to Providence, and we rehearsed, and we hit the road for a real long time in the States and in uh, Europe. And uh, we went to England since our our label was English. Uh, we ended up being over there a lot uh, and doing a lot of stuff. And um, Tommy did a lot of that with us, and we really sure miss him right now. Yeah, rest in peace. Yeah, I'm very, too. very sorry for your loss. Yeah, he was a very good artist. He is a, yeah. a really a one-of-a-kind guy, a, a really great artist. Uh, I think maybe very underrated guitarist. Inspired one of my big, my newest EP that's out, heavily inspired. Like, there's three songs that you could pull the keen right out of. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's really was, cool. uh, yeah, you know, and it's funny. A lot of people really uh, that didn't maybe didn't know him that well, but had seen him and stuff. He always, whenever he would meet somebody, they felt like he was their friend, and he was like that. He was that that's kind awesome. of a guy, you know. So everyone on Facebook's, you know. So feels the hit so oh, hard. Oh yeah, really. Like, even though they might not have been good friends with him, they feel like they were, you know. And, and sadly, about, sadly yeah. with me, he was one of those artists where I started listening to him after the fact that mm -hmm. he passed away. And if it's, it's always one of those moments where it's like, oh my god, how did I not know about this guy's music? He's incredible. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't know. Same he, here. He had, he had a long career, but a lot of it was, um, I think he was, uh, you know, undiscovered by a lot of people as the initially. You know, he had kind of a big push going. I think with the labels that he was on and stuff. And then he kept, he was always going, he never stopped. But I found that, you know, playing with Matthew, um, you know, Tommy would open for us uh, in the later years. He opened acoustic for us, which was great. And um, uh, I was surprised some places that people didn't really know who he was. And I was like, how can you not know? <laughs> I was just really shocked because, I, you know, just because I've known about him for so long myself, but I'm a musician, so maybe it's different, but he was one of those guys. I remember when I first started playing, at, people at the record store would go, "Hey, this guy Tommy King's playing tonight. You've got to go see him." And I'd go there, and there would be like 15 people, maybe there. You know, the guys from the record store and me and some other guys that they told and shows, really yeah. knew. But he came out and he just like kicked ass. You know, his show. He he's just always went, you know, 110 percent playing for one or for a thousand people or whatever. You know, and uh, so I was see him the first time, and you're like, okay. This guy is like, you know, this guy's happening, you know. So uh, I was a fan from that, and then I got into the records kind of after kind of seeing him live. And, uh, you know, he, he just never stopped. He was really the real the real deal as far as he really put everything into it. That's just what he was. He was that. You know, he was that. That's awesome. That player and that guy. And, um, you know, a nice guy and uh, um understated sort of guy and um i don't know he was just he was just one of those guys like once he touches somebody once he meets you you're everyone's sort of touched forever i think oh, by him and that's awesome. what you can see and uh, yeah so we really miss him and we were we were originally planning in fact i have to credit him with being the main cheerleader of uh sort of reuniting velvet crush in the past few years he was like you know we got to do it Can, you know we got to do this we got to do this and so we said okay okay we're going to do it we're going to do it and so he was going to be part of that and um, before we really got it rolling, you know, he left us, and um, it took us a little bit to really, to really process that and figure out what, how to go, go forward with it, because we hadn't played in such a long time, and um, Tommy was just going to be there, you know, we were going to start up the four of us, we were going to start doing it, and and then he was gone, and we were like, oh shit, man, what are we going to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not, you know, it seemed like not possible at that point, you know. Um, even though he wasn't a charter member of the band, he was kind right. of uh, definitely a member, you know, uh, after 
logging so much time with us and just we were we were close to him we were friends and we had in recent years Rick and I had been playing with him you know had been uh, hanging out with him on Matthew's tours because he'd been opening for the tours that we do with Matthew Sweet in the summer and so we spent like a bunch of time with him more more re recently and so it was just really uh, sort of devastating when he left for, for a lo lots of different reasons but I do have to credit him with pushing forth the the crush reuniting sort of thing and then and then we decided well he'd be mad if we didn't do this you know even though he's gone he would be sort of pissed off at us if we didn't do so we decided we had to mm -hmm. continue forward and uh find someone to fill his shoes so that's what we uh, attempted to do <clears throat> that's a very and that's very good that you guys did that you know as a tribute to him so and yeah, speaking, I, mean, you know, I, I think about him every show that we did. I think I thought about him in some way during that time, during the show, or during before or after or something, because he, it's sort of part of the whole, um, the whole ball of wax. Really, is what it became, you know. Because he, I didn't realize that maybe until, until later, until he was gone, maybe because, uh, you know, we hadn't played since really he played with us, and, uh, but later on, I'm thinking like, God, he really was really connected to a lot of this stuff in my mind, in my heart, you know. So. Um, but we, you know, we're sallying forth with our friend uh, Jason Victor, who uh, is a, you know, amazing guitar player and a great person, and um, also a friend was a friend of Tommy's. So um, we're all, you know, we all feel his uh, his presence when we're on stage. <laughs> it's yeah. what it's probably what Tommy would have wanted, you know. I hope, yeah. And he was, yeah. he was. I know he was. Uh, he he wasn't friends with Jason as long as us. He just kind of just met him a few years ago, but he. Really liked him. I think I could tell he was really, really like Jason, and, and Jason really liked him. So I think he would have approved of that, you know, <laughs> of, of us uh, having him fill fill in for him. Not the same at oh, all. They're yeah. really different players, but they're both good, uh, good people. And that's kind of more what we we kind of go for guys that we can work with that we like and admire, and you know, can do stuff with. It's not really about what they do as much as how they do it and how they are, I think, when, with, as far as the crush is concerned. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of Matthew Sweet, by the way, what was it like, uh, what was it like working with him? How did, how did that come about? Well, that goes back a long, long ways. Uh, um, I, mm, let's see. Rick, uh, Rick was the instigator and Rick uh. met, Rick lived in, uh, in Iowa. Or, I mean, went to school in Iowa. He's from uh, Illinois, but he went to school in Iowa. And while he was in school, I think he somehow heard uh, maybe Matthew's recordings that were uh, called the Buzz of Delight was the the group name, and it was just him and another guy, basically Matthew's songs, and so Rick wrote to him and became friends and fans with him, and then at the same time I Rick was doing a band called the Reverbs, um, in Chicago, and I had heard that. And I went to meet the guy who recorded that stuff at their studio in Barrington, Illinois. And so he said, "You got to meet my friend Rick, because he and you and he are of a same of a kind, you know." And he said, uh, "You got to meet him." So he's going to come to Champaign to go to this show. And I can't remember what it was. It was like replacements or some kind of show like that. And so anyway, Rick came. He said, "I said, well, how will I know who he is?" He goes, "Well, he's a really tall, gangly guy. You'll see. You'll know. You'll know." I said, "All right, all right." <laughs> so I went and uh, and he told Rick. You know, I was going to go, and so Rick and I met, and that was around the same time when, when Rick met Matthew. So I started doing stuff with Rick, and uh, Rick kept in touch with Matthew, and then Matthew at the time had been um, writing songs, and he signed to what they called, I don't know if they have these anymore, but at that time they had these things called development deals. Oh. And that's where like a major label would sort of get an artist, and they would sort of develop them to to be a future recording artist, but like they weren't, they weren't going to put a record out right now, but they were kind of like put him on the payroll somewhat. I'm not sure if it was fully, but a little, at least a little bit, they'd give him some sort of money to do like, to do demos and to work on stuff and send them stuff. And they'd kind of go over time go, Oh yeah, this is getting, this is getting somewhere. This is cool. And then we're going to release a record. So he was doing that. And then at one point um, they were going to release a record then finally. And he said, Oh my God, I, they want me to tour. I don't have a band. So he called Rick and said, I don't have, what am I going to do? I don't know. I don't have a band, you know, like I'm just like a songwriter guy. And, you know, I know some people, but I don't like have a touring band. And Rick said, well, let me, you know, let me call my friend, Paul. He might, probably play bass. And, I, and so he did. And I said, yeah, sure. And then Rick, called a couple other people and then we had sort of an instant band and that was our first tour and that's the first time I worked with Matthew 
And we went and practiced. And do you guys know this band Shoes from uh, Illinois, from Zion, Illinois? They're like a power pop band from the 70s. No, but I'm definitely they sound checking familiar. them out. I'm going to be doing a podcast soon on uh, Well, they're great. They're still around. They don't put out stuff very often, definitely. but they're still around. And they were, they're friends. Of, Rick was friends with them. I'm friends with them now. And the guy I work with, John, in Small Square, is, also plays drums with them and is good friends with them. But anyway, they had a studio in Zion, Illinois, which is up in the northern, northern Illinois, and um, they had a studio called Short Order Recorder, and we went there and rehearsed with Matthew for the first tour, oh, that's <laughs> which, awesome. was kind of funny. <laughs> which was kind of fun and funny. And um, so anyway, we did a first tour. It was for Matthew's record called Earth, which maybe people don't really know so much. Oh, but it's I... got a really different production style, but uh, of course the songs are all really strong and great you know, pop songs and worth worth checking out. But they were doing a different thing. It's it's way different from Girlfriend, um, production wise, but um, song wise, great. Oh, you know, he's just a great, uh, you know, writer talent. He just hundred yeah, percent fun is my favorite album <laughs> for Matthew Sweet. I love Matthew Sweet. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, I mean, he 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 was kind of looking for different stuff, and the, the, when he first started, so his first two records don't sound anything like Girlfriend so much. I mean, you can hear the song wise they kind of do, but the production was just all different stuff they were trying. And then finally, Girlfriend happened, and that was complete departure from, I think, those other two records. And then from there, uh, his kind of more rock thing kind of started, and he kind of found his found his footing on that. And then that was comfortable for him, and that that's where it went from there. And then yeah, onto like, you know, um, uh, Altered Beast and Hundred Percent Fun, and that, that you know, then it all sort of. Yeah makes sense that arc but the first part is a little bit different so it's actually quite interesting to go and check that out and even if you can find the buzz of delight uh record uh it was an ep and vinyl i don't know if it got reissued i can't remember if it became combined with something else but um really cool songs on that really just like little homespun kind of thing that he did uh he played <laughs> he made an instrument uh, like a, it was part guitar and part bass, and he called it. I think it was called a bag bone or something like that. Oh, really? And he played it. <laughs> and he played it on this record, so it's like got a bass line and a little guitar lines playing at the same time, and it's this one. That's awesome. Like, like four string. I don't know how many strings it had. It had like two bass strings and some guitar strings or something like that. I can't remember. I don't even know how he came up with that idea, but that's what he used on this. I think on this Buzz of Delight recording, which is really uh, quite cool. Really, uh, really, you know. The beginning of his you can you can hear how the songs are they're different but they're like yeah the seeds of the cool ideas are there if i'm not mistaken i have earth on vinyl oh this is cool yeah yeah, yeah. Earth, is, uh, yeah. Earth, earth is yeah. the tour the record that we toured with his first, oh, first that's, tour. i didn't know that. oh, that's, that's awesome. really when i first kind of met matthew was during that and uh, then uh, we worked together ever since then we took a little time off rick and i when we were when we got sort of heavy into the crush like during that uh teenage symphonies time we kind of had to we couldn't really do touring with them. I think Rick still played on records, but he, uh, Matthew had another drummer also playing, this guy Stuart huh. Johnson. And so he played on some of the records too, or some, I think Rick played on sort of half of the songs because we were really, you know, like I said, we were on the road so much and we couldn't really do both things. So we we, we weren't on tour with Matthew for 100% uh, uh, Fun and Altered Beast. I think we were gone during that, doing mm -hmm. Teenage stuff and then we came back and we were playing since then basically since that time so we started with girlfriend with him and then or with earth then girlfriend then took some time off and then came back so yeah it's been quite a long ride with him but you know i love his music I, it feels like my own music kind of in a way like i feel it's so comfortable to play his songs that it's like a no no effort sort of thing you know it's like oh yeah this is you know, I, I completely understand his songs. That's you know, awesome. Just, I think, you know, I, I feel like I do anyways. And they're always, a, they're always a pleasure. It's like the great song that I never wrote, you know, like it's like that kind of thing. Like, oh, I wish I'd done that, you know. But um, they're so easy to play, I think, um, just because I can I can understand where he's coming from with it. And, and we know each other well, personally. And so you connect. That's cool. Professionally. Yeah. And, and he and Rick and I just play together without really thinking too much. Oh, yeah. Know? We can just start playing, and so we, you know, we've had different guitar players, and we still continue to kind of have guys coming and going. Uh, Jason's been playing. Jason Victor has been playing recently, and this guy John Mormon, who's also a great player from a band. He was formerly in a band called the Orange Peels. But we've had different guitar players over the years. But since we've played together, the core of us, um, we can always get a guy coming in, and, and I think they can slot themselves in because there's a solid 
you know, kind of foundation to, to start from. And they have to just find their, find their way, but we're already kind of there, you know, so hopefully it, it makes it sort of an instant band, I think, usually. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing looking back at the, uh, at the ways he's, you know, like written out these kinds of songs, like the, the arrangements of certain stuff. Cause my kids, uh, cause I, I work at a school of rock up here in Fort Washington every now and then I'm kind of like a cool. on and off situation. One of the songs <laughs> that we covered in a show was girlfriend and listening back to that a whole bunch of times was like really such an experience like getting to hear like all these different layers to the song that the kids were learning and everything they picked up and they it took it took a while for them to pick up on it at first but they really they really got it down so that's a good song too I like it really it. is yeah yeah it was, one of, yeah, that, it was one of my favorite songs in the show too so yeah it's always a fun one and uh kind of different from a lot of his songs i think even though it's sort of a signature song it, it's it seems not like a lot of the songs. It's got it's really its own, its own feel and its own energy. And the recording of it is, I think, pretty different from the way we do it live. But um, the only song of his that was in a that was in a Guitar Hero game, and that is such a crime. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Should yeah, be more. I should be more. I never thought like, 100% fun stuff should have been on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I should, they should, they, they I'm sick of myself. <laughs> sick of myself. Sick of myself. Sick of myself. Yeah. Natural for that, yeah. The oh, Bowling for Soup covered sick of myself, and they do it really well. And I was like really surprised because usually covering a Matthew Sweet isn't easy, but it's like it's cool to have a, a power pop or a punk pop band covering Matthew Sweet, and they do it pretty yeah. well. Yeah. I was surprised. No, I, think, I think that that speaks to the the you know the the quality of the song. It can be done in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Because the, song, the core of the song is is just good you know it's, it's universal like, it's a universal message. yeah exactly yeah it transcends i was listening to stuff. early demos of uh when it was like i need a friend and all the like earlier stuff of it I've, I've found over the years of hearing some demos here and there and i was like this is so cool how it progressed and how it became this like big hit when matthew sweet should have a ton more but it's cool to just like sick of myself is really good and uh <laughs> the other one too i forget what the other one is but a couple of them off 100 percent fun are just fantastic for um, sure yeah yeah, but, yeah i wanted a... to ask what was the touring life like during that stage when you guys were on conan too right for velvet crush and all that oh yeah, yeah velvet crush we were on conan i've been on conan a bunch of times oh, with that's Matthew, awesome. actually but um like how's, how's conan how how is that experience that's something i would <laughs> dream of well you know we did the first the velvet crush uh conan and probably the first matthew one we did were in the old the original conan studios in new york and it was oh. like the which was the, <laughs> what was it now it used to be that uh, was in a that was in 30 rock right yeah, but it was one of the other ones, and it used to be something. I can't remember what it was now. It was another show, you know. It was a smaller one. It was a pretty small studio, you know, surprisingly small that first time. And then he moved, you know, studios later. But um, Conan was great. He's a he's a music fan, and uh, he seems like a pretty nice dude. Like he was – I remember – I don't know which time it was, but I remember him kind of wandering the hall um, before the show, and he has like an acoustic guitar strapped on. He's just walking around kind of strumming it because he plays a little, and – uh, he likes Matthew's music. He's a fan, you know, but he would, so he'd walk around and kind of for relax, for relaxation, I guess, before the show, he's playing guitar and kind of hanging out and he's chatting with everybody really casual. The first time he went, it was very casual. And, oh, that's, uh, that's and he came in, I remember he came in and he was talking to me about, uh, I was playing a Hofner at the time cause I used it on Teenage symphonies a lot. And he was like, Oh, I like, really like your Hofner. And he was talking to me about that and real, you know, just a hanging out kind of guy. He was really nice. And, uh, and he, he became kind of friends with Matthew and we would always, you know, invite him back. So we were on that show uh, several times. Oh, that's but fantastic. Wow. The, crush, the crush thing on the show was a little bit weird. It's the only time I've done TV a bunch of times and it's the only time this ever happened. But during the performance, like how they, do you guys know how they do this? They, they, um, they film the, the band. It's not uh, like the show kind of runs in real time, although it's not live, you know? Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. So they, they film it in the afternoon and then, yeah, that but noise. it goes in yeah. order, and they run it sort of, you know, like a play or something. It goes yeah. in order, and then some bands do the – some shows do the band first. I've been on ones where they do it like on uh, – Like SNL kind of does it. Like or something, they did yeah. it like that. But, but anyway, on this one, they run it – most of them that I've done, they run in real time. So you get to your part, and they take a break for uh, commercial time, and then they set up, and then you do your – you do oh, your wow. uh, thing, and it's last. It was last, so you do your – you know, your three minute song or whatever. So you get all amped up and then you just play, play one song, you know, and then you're done. So we did that in front of the audience and we played. And, um, at the end they said, Hey, we had a, we had a problem with one of the cameras, uh, during the, during your song. So I was wondering if you, uh, if you could do it again. And we're like, uh, but at that point you're like, Oh my God, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> so yeah. 
people like, yeah, sure, what are you going to do? You know, they had to do that to do it. So, so they said, okay, if Conan's going to you know, to ask the audience that they'll stay a minute and um, and then he'll reintroduce you, he'll re-throw it over to you guys and then <laughs> let's do it again. And so um, we said, yeah, sure, we'll do that. But that's the only time I've ever had anything like that happen. Really? That's interesting. It was awry on TV. And uh, that performance was kind of odd because we had with us we had uh, the great Mitch Easter playing guitar with us. Ooh, oh yeah, that was my uh, that was my next question. What it was like working with him? It was the three of us and Mitch, and then we I don't know how this happened, but um, this friend of ours from Boston, this guy Dave, named Dave Minahan, who was in a great band called The Neighborhoods. Oh okay. Happened yeah, I, I think I know them. Yeah. There. He happened to be there. I don't know why he was <laughs> around. He was around somehow, and and uh, we saw him. And Rick said, "Hey, you want to do hold me up with this our song? You know, tonight oh. we're gonna play a ton." And he goes, um, "Okay, I'll I'll go learn it." You know, and so he played with this. <laughs> He'd never played this before or since. Oh, but that's. He awesome. in, but he came and just kind of you know buds from you know we knew him from the Boston yeah. Providence kind of connection and stuff. And his band, the neighborhoods were around forever, and they were great, and everybody knew him, you know. So, but anyway, he just I'm not sure why he was there. Maybe they had played earlier in the week or something. But so he played. So it was like a five piece crush on that one, and um, it was really kind of a weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. I mean, not, it wasn't weird because of Dave. It was just weird that that happened, and then the, the camera broke and all that. I'm um, working with Mitch on uh, two records. We did Teeny Symphonies, and then the next record called Heavy Changes. We did them both. At great transition. Uh, great transition, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, tie it Perfect, Paul. <laughs> a million things. So I'm just trying to keep it. Keep, no, keep me awesome. reined in, guys, if you can. Anyway, no, no Mitch, worries. This is perfect. Uh, <laughs> Mitch is a great. Uh, we, we we admired Mitch, you know, and so we. We wanted to try and we had a little money to spend on a real producer at that point to do that record. So we said we'd like to try and get this guy Mitch Easter. And the creation said, okay, that that's okay. You know, they knew who he was. And so uh, we, you know, we got him. We made a contract with him and stuff. And we went to do pre production and we were kind of green. So we went and, you know, played for him. And <laughs> like, it was kind of weird. And we wouldn't do it the same way now. But we didn't know him at that at that time until we started working with him. But he's very gracious. And uh, he's incredibly knowledgeable uh, about music. And uh, he's like an engineer, you know, an audio guy and uh, about all things. He's a very intelligent guy. And a really, really great musician. And so uh, sympathetic um, to what's happening, what, what the music is that's happening. You know, he can just plug himself into it. And, and uh, you know, we, we asked him to contribute a lot. He plays a lot of guitar on the record. He was the lead guitar player on the record for the most part right. on Teeny Symphonies. And, and mm -hmm. um, we, you know, he doesn't do that unless you ask him. So we asked him and he would always come up with something that oh, was cool, really fitting. And we'd, we'd give him reference points. He, he knows any reference. I, I swear, you know, he knows like any musical reference. He can oh. Throw and, oh, so we're like, we were thinking sort of like this, you know, and, and he would, uh, you know, just be able to do it. And uh, so easily, it seemed easy for him to do. And then of course the record, uh, sounds the way it sounds because of his you know recording engineering and stuff and uh, mixing. his work with rem is insanely good too oh yeah so, so it's, yeah, it's amazing so, <laughs> he is such a, you know such creative a... guy and and he has uh he has all you can sort of work seems like he can sort of work like any different way of recording yeah. like whatever whatever you want you come up yeah with. i would love i would love <laughs> to just sit down and have a chat with yeah him me too <laughs> recording engineering shit like that like, so much he's worked with so many people and he's so uh he's such a fan of music and he's so smart oh, so and knows good. so much stuff and we were we were hugely um satisfied to work with him and and honored and uh and i think it was a for me anyway and i think for all of us it was a really um um sort of changing experience um just to work with somebody like that and he was so gracious you know with us with you know, some dumb guys that came to work with him you know he doesn't know us or anything and um, but he, uh, we became friends and, um, you know, I would work with him again in a, you know, a heartbeat if we, if we could, it'd be great. But he, but it was such a great uh, way to make that record. And I, I really feel like he was a big part of it and it wouldn't have, you know, the songs were the songs and we had the songs, but I think the whole thing wouldn't have turned out, uh, it would have been different. I don't know. You know, I think it would have been a lot different record without him at the helm because a lot of the stuff, he made a lot of the stuff happen and, and, uh, figured out how to, how to, uh, do our vision and add to that, you know, so. And actually work with uh, you, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was so cool for us to do that. Cause we're like, we got him. He's going to work with us. You know, we were like, we were so excited to, you know, be able to, to just do it with him. So we went to his, 
his house and you know we were hanging out there we were there for quite a while we met his we knew his parents so at that time we were at the drive-in which was the original his original studio it's called the drive-in and it was actually at the former garage of his parents house wow. oh wow <laughs> in Winston Salem North Carolina and so um, and that's where the REM they did this stuff they did some of the stuff also at reflection where where we did our basics we did basics at reflection in Charlotte and we did that with him there, and then we moved to his house or to the drive-in later. And then, um, um, let's see, I think we finished that record there. And then uh, between the two records, the next record, Heavy Changes, he, he moved the studio to uh, his house, which was just outside of Winston-Salem in Kernersville. And now that's – it's called the Fidelitorium, and that's, that's where it was. Although at that, at that time there was no studio building. It was just in his house. And so that's where we made heavy changes in his house in Kernersville. And um, it was, you know, the same thing, just different. We had stuff set up in bedrooms and uh, upstairs. There was a two-story house, and uh, it was a little bit different uh, environment, but the same, you know, him being the same. And uh, the only problem was we didn't have our songs together quite as much. <laughs> so we spent uh, a long time, like, sort of living at his house with him, which is incredible. But I can't remember. <laughs> I, I don't know why we... He must have been slightly insane at that time, but he let us stay in his house <laughs> for like weeks just trying to, you know, I was writing, trying to finish writing, and then we record, and we were there for a long time, and I don't know how he, you know, tolerated having us there, but <laughs> um, so we, we did that second record with him also. So, yeah, it was really fun. Um, just any, any doing anything with him was great because he was... He made every he made everything sort of possible. You know, we we could come up with any sort of idea, and he'd go, "Well, well, we can do this," you know. And he would just sort of know how to do it. And uh, that's a talent right there. Wow. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah, a no great kidding. great engineer. And you know, people know he's a great musician and stuff. Maybe now more so, but he is yeah, a great. People really need to give him a lot more credit. But he is uh, a. Warren Hurt, if you're Warren Hurt, if you're listening to this podcast somehow, <laughs> please. Get Mitch Easter on your show. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, if you, you know should, him, you hook him, him up. I'd love to. Probably do an interview with you. I'm sure. Oh yeah. well, yeah, we'll definitely. We'll send him this one. I'll, I'll nice message him. Yeah, uh, I'll email him. him. That'd oh, be wait, awesome. So you, so you know Warren Hewitt personally? No, yeah, he's talking should. about. Yeah. Oh, oh well. yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he has the yeah. connection with uh with Roger Manning from Jellyfish. So. Oh, the yeah, 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 I know the um yeah. produce like a pro. Yeah, yeah. He's a great yeah, that podcast. That's a great one. But yeah, Mitch, Mitch should be on here too. That'd be great. He'd be a great yeah. guest on on any show. Cause awesome. Would really I would I would talk hours. REM, Velvet Crush, all that stuff. It's just Mitch is something who I look up to, and I'm not really a guy that does a lot of studio stuff. That's Tyler. Uh, Tyler, you got that. <laughs> but I, I'm more <laughs> the guy that records and, and tries to get my music out there. But to hear these guys behind the scenes, like and, and to know these guys, the inner works that it takes a team. It's it's, it's not yeah, just the band. Incredible. It's not just yeah. the band sometimes, and it's amazing because to, to well, hear you say it too, yeah. Know, he, he did the REM stuff with a with a guy Don Dixon, who mm, I also yes. know the honor of knowing. Who's another great musician and songwriter and, and all that kind of stuff, an engineer and producer. They're they're both so talented, and they did stuff uh, on the early REM records that I was kind of surprised to find out was I'll just say and like Murmur is real good too. But, but they yeah. did a lot of uh, they did stuff that I didn't know. And at the time when I heard heard this, when they told me these stories, I was like, wow, really? You know, like so they, they would definitely be a great. Uh, you know, got a that'd be great awesome. Guys. Hey, yeah. <laughs> hey, because they worked with so many artists and they had so much yeah. experience. From the, that'd be so cool. Done, you know, done their own stuff as well, and so you know, so they have lots of uh, lots of stories to tell, lots of knowledge to impart. And I wanted to say, Paul, I wanted to thank you uh, for the time. I remember uh, I saw you, uh, you and Matthew Sweet, you know, but actually, technically, Velvet Crush with Matthew Sweet now. Uh, but it was really cool to that backstage. You were walking back, and I said, "Hey, you're from Velvet Crush," and you actually turned around oh. and came out. And it was really cool. It was at the FTC in Connecticut. Oh and yeah, just, I remember um, that. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I had you sign the Matthew Sweet thing for me, and I, we got it laminated. Yeah. It's up on my wall now. I got a whole, I got my Posey stuff on the wall, but I got my other side is all other bands and stuff. So, all right, uh, it's really cool. And I want to thank you for that because that was an experience that. You know, you don't expect, and I wanted to thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. I like to talk so, to the to Perfect, the yeah. And especially when somebody's like, hey, Velvet Crush. Busy. We can usually get busy because we're, like, yeah. playing roadie and wrapping up the cables and Oh, stuff. yeah. Oh, perfect, like yeah. To, you know, of course, we always like to talk to the, the people that make it possible to do that which is people coming to the show you know so oh yeah thank you so much yeah it's cool because actually my uncle was telling me um he has a friend of his 
that actually grew up with Matthew Sweet and went to school with him. him. Oh, there we and go. she, so she might have a connection. And my uncle said to let me know. I just texted him now. I was like, hey, we're talking to Paul Chastain. So shout out to my uncle down there in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's a big Velvet Crush fan. Actually, without him, I wouldn't know oh. you guys. So it's a shout out to that. All right. So, well, thanks, uncle. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, we'll uh, wrap things up, Tyler. If you want to ask that last question, we'll All wrap right, things sure. up. Perfect. So as we were talking earlier, Paul, you live in Japan. I do. So, nope. so what's it what's it like as someone from the states who who relocated to you know still come back to the states and work you know with all these different bands and stuff? What's it? How do you how are you able to manage all this stuff? Well, I, I mostly just go back in the summer at this point. Um, so that's when Matthew usually oh, okay. does touring stuff, and uh, that's kind of when we will be doing uh, most of our sort of Velvet Crush stuff. We did just do. Uh, in October, we did uh, two Velvet Crush shows over here. Yeah, I missed them. I was going to drive, but we missed them. Yeah, <laughs> a long drive. So we did. So we did uh, that. Those two shows over here, and that's uh, the first time we played over here in a very, very long time. Yeah. But so uh, most uh, does Velvet Crush have a state. decent following in the in Japan. Um, you know, it's decent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. the thing about Japanese fans is they, um, they. I mean, you know, they're all older now, but but I think the fans in general, they're sort of like lifelong fans of people, not just us. Oh, that's awesome. The music that they like. So, okay. so there yeah. were, I saw a lot of people there that I hadn't seen in uh, 25 or 30 years, you know, because they, they made the effort to come out. And then there were some younger people there as well, you know. But they really, uh, once they like something, they like it, and they, they will stick with you. So oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great place to to uh, for, for any bands if they haven't ever come over to play because the fans are so uh, – they're such big music fans and they and they just like go crazy they love it you know and they they really take it to heart i know so bands it's... like praying mantis from the 80s a metal band that they were not really big over in the states they went over to japan and they were huge and it's like yeah, and they got... love it i mean people yeah. love they when they like something they just really like oh, it that's so awesome long. and it's a great i guess i know where i'm going <laughs> when velvet crush first came to japan to play we couldn't believe i, I know a lot of other bands have the same comment i think but like just how they're into it and like they treat you like you know you're really something special and you're you know the the way you you wanted it to be kind of in your fantasies but it could never really be and then you go back to the states and it's like well we got five people tonight and nobody really gives a crap <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know so oh. it's like it's like you don't want to go it's like yeah, it we'll play exist. it does exist i guess they, yeah. you know uh, here and spain also great great pop music fans in Spain and like yeah, in Sweden. Yeah, I've noticed that with uh, like that. Posey's playing Spain a lot too. Like Ken's been talking yeah, about Spain, that Yeah, Spain, they're great, huge, huge pop fan music fans and it's similar. It's a way, in a way, it's I think it's kind of similar to the way the Japanese oh, that's awesome. fans are. There's two of the greatest places to, to do uh, maybe any kind, of, any kind of music, I think, because they just are great lovers of music i think you know they love it and they take it to heart and the way they the way they react to it is that you're just like what they really like it this much you know like <laughs> you can't believe it. it must be a mistake but anyway <laughs> so so mostly i just go to the states in the summer and um but i do go other times like i'm actually heading over at the end of january i'm going to go over and we're going to do some writing velvet crush writing and I'm all gonna right do some, uh, let me know if you're in the connecticut area or anything i'll uh, well, we're bring some be, records uh, for you we're going to be in rhode island actually oh cool that's not too far but we're if you're doing any shows let me know area yeah soon. yeah no, well we don't have any shows oh, okay. scheduled, but we're planning to do something i don't know if we're going to do something this summer i hope we're, we're right, cool yeah i'd be we'll down do to that. i'll bring some records go, i got my hold me now 45 yeah. for you i gotta hold me now 45 i could have you see for you <laughs> all right <I'll laughs> show you. and also i'm gonna go over uh right when i first get back i'm gonna go to, to uh wisconsin where i Ooh. do the small square stuff and we always every time i go to the states i get together with john who uh owns a studio up there called oh. uh, drum farm and Ooh. we uh, so we so we just go in and we start we either work on songs or we record stuff or uh, both kind of things and uh it's up in rural wisconsin in menominee so it's really cool to go there and just kind of unplug from everything and just kind of do music stuff. Oh, it's beautiful. So this time I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to go straight to uh, straight to Portsmouth, Rhode Island, and uh, do some songwriting with Rick and Jeffrey. Awesome. So I got a lot, Shout out a lot to of Rick and Jeffrey. Winter music happening this year. Then I'll come back and then uh, come over for playing in the summer if Matthew does stuff, which I assume he will, but I don't really know. Haven't heard yet. All right, awesome. Well, let, let Matthew know or Rick or Jeff if they want to come up on the show. Let, let them know that yeah, we're, we're available. Yeah. We would love to have them up. Okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, it would be an honor. Even if all you guys wanted to come on and talk about the tour or something, it'd be something that we would love to to have you guys come up. Be a complete All honor. right, well, we can definitely do something. And, you know, if, if not uh, at this thing, then we'll probably be playing 
some East Coast stuff again. Sweet. You know, yeah. uh, since since Jeffrey's kind of based out there, we'll probably um, be doing. Yeah, I'm in East Connecticut Coast. and Tyler's in could, Philly. Maybe we could set up uh, if we're doing shows around there too. Maybe we could set up a little. You know, a short thing with all three of us that might be fun. Just oh, cool! Yeah, if oh, yeah, uh, totally. if if Tyler, if, yeah. yeah, if Tyler can make it because uh, Tyler's down in Philly and I'm in CT, so we'll have to find out a thing because we actually never. Tyler and I, the cool thing about this podcast is we met over our love of uh, the posies, and we didn't um, actually meet yet. We've have done this all online, uh, we're back and forth, <laughs> so it's just a really cool thing. Guys, so the internet, we got to we got to we got to meet up soon. So that'd be cool. That'd be kind of cool, someday. like a legendary first meetup would be with Paul Chastain's of uh, Velvet Crush right? and the band. That'd be something cool. But we're always talking yeah. about it, so it'll we're be definitely be a cool the, thing. The Crush will definitely be playing, and I and I think probably awesome. in the again because we didn't our little thing that we did was just kind of a get your feet wet kind of thing. So we're gonna do a proper. Yeah. You yeah, my dad play, and I uh, wanted to come, but we couldn't, like, on the ticket site or something, and then we just something came up, so we couldn't make it. But we were definitely going to drive from Connecticut to, to Rhode Island we'll, to come we'll see We'll be back, guys. and we're, we'll be doing, you know, bigger, a little cool. bigger city. Because I saw city. Ken in Providence recently at the Music Mansion or something. It was some play. It was an oddball show, but it was really cool, and we mm-hmm. drove all the way to Providence, so it was yeah, interesting. Yeah, Providence, there's some cool little stuff around Yeah. There. We played at that uh, theater, the Columbia Theater there, which oh, okay. was really cool. And, um... Uh, Jeffrey sort of has connection to that. We, so we were playing there, and then we did we did all little area. There were small little places, most of them. So it was just kind of like, just to remember how to do it, kind of you know, and <laughs> play together. So, so but, but the point is, we're gonna do uh, you know, we'll be doing like New York and and other other oh, large cool. cities in, in the future. Uh, in the in the next couple of years, for sure, we'll be back in the East Coast. So, all right, awesome. Well, if any anybody's got further remarks before we end the uh, the, the the interview, but but thank you, Paul, for for coming on. This is yeah, an thank insane you so honor. Much. It was, thank it you. Was, this is something that two so of us. Uh, you on. Well, thanks for asking. And if there's anything no needs clarification, you know, afterwards, you want to write to me, I can tell you what I was talking about because I was rambling a bit oh, there. Oh, um, sweet. We're, I'm usually what I do is, uh, you know, we could talk after. Perfect. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll clear up. But uh, we'll we'll end here. Uh, everybody, say bye. <laughs> everybody, bye. 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 All right, guys. Thanks. <laughs>